welcome to the Military Women's Memorial for an historic event. Welcome all. So I'm going to start with the formalities as we know we must do to welcome some of our VIPs in the room. So we want to welcome Ambassador Karen Williams and Ambassador Jean Maines. Welcome here. All of our generals and flag officers that are in this room and ideally watching virtually. And of course, I could spend the next 10 minutes recognizing everyone in the room. So we're just going to leave it at and welcome to all of our distinguished visitors today. We're delighted to welcome you to America's only major national memorial that honors the three million women that have defended this nation since the Revolutionary War. I'm Phyllis Wilson, an Army Chief Warrant Officer 5 retired and the president of the Women in Military Service for America Memorial Foundation, the organization responsible for the operation and maintenance of this lovely building. The memorial is well positioned to be a leading voice and a resource in support of the U.S. strategy on women, peace, and security. Now, our approach is to place the perspectives and the experiences of service women at the forefront of the discussions with practitioners, scholars, and leaders from across the public and private sectors, as well as with our partner nations to better understand the essential role of women in global security and defense efforts, and to work towards equality for future generations at home and around the globe. Today's program, Beyond Firsts, Powering the Future Force, will address one of the critical issues facing the Department of Defense today, recruiting and retention of the best and the most competent personnel, our most treasured and critical resource as we shape our force for the future and the critical national defense issues that it will bring. Joining us today are the Department of Defense's four most senior military women. I'm going to give you a short bio of each of them. Admiral Linda Fagan is the Commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard. Admiral Fagan is the 27th Commandant of the Coast Guard, and she is the first woman in the history of our nation to lead a branch of the military. As Commandant, she oversees all global Coast Guard operations and 42,000 active duty, 7,000 reserve, and 8,700 civilian personnel, as well as the support of the 21,000 Coast Guard Auxiliary Volunteers. Air Force General Jacqueline Van Ovost, Commander, United States Transportation Command. She is the 14th Commander of Transcom, one of the 11 combatant commands. U.S. Transcom's mission is to project and sustain military power globally in order to assure our friends and our allies deter potential adversaries and, if necessary, respond to win decisively. Army General Laura Richardson, Commander, U.S. Southern Command. She is the 32nd Commander of the U.S. Southern Command, another of the 11 Defense Department combatant commands. It's responsible for providing contingency planning, operations, and security cooperation for Central and Southern America, the Caribbean, and for the force protection of U.S. military resources at these locations. And it's also responsible for ensuring the defense of the Pan Panama Canal and the canal areas. And Navy Admiral Lisa Franchetti, Vice Chief of Naval Operations. She is the 42nd Vice Chief of Naval Operations, the second highest ranking naval officer, and functions as the principal deputy of the Chief of Naval Operations, who is responsible to the Secretary of the Navy for the command, utilization of resources, and operation of the Navy. Among her duties, if the Chief of Naval Operations is absent or unable to perform his or her duties, the Vice would assume such. And I am proud to say that here today, here at the Military Women's Memorial, it is the first time that all four of them have had the opportunity to be together in public. 
they did have a private dinner last night, so they kind of <laughs> blew my quote, but uh, in public, I'll say. So this is a great day, not only for all of you to hear from these extraordinary military leaders, but it's a great day as well for military women and a great way for the Military Women's Memorial to kick off Women's History Month. But that's not all. We have the distinct pr privilege to have join us today one of America's leading television journalists and anchor of the CBS Evening News, Nora O'Donnell. Nora has covered presidential elections and interviewed some of the most influential world leaders. She's a frequent contributing journalist to 60 Minutes, the recipient of multiple Emmy Awards, and the list goes on and on. And today, she will be moderating the discussion of some of the military's most influential leaders, the four women, four stars, joining us today. So without further delay, I welcome our distinguished panel and the moderator to the stage here at the Vaught Center of the Military Women's Memorial. And thank you all for joining us in person and virtual guests from across the country, including organizations like Air Force Women's Initiatives Team, University ROTC programs, service academies, and veterans affairs groups. We would love for you to share and engage with us on social media today and use the hashtag beyond first. Nora, please join us all, and Nora will take over from here. Well, good afternoon and welcome everybody. How thrilling it is to be here. Phyllis, thank you so much for your incredible leadership and your introductory remarks. We appreciate it. Isn't this a fantastic spot? Um, I am thrilled to be here amongst so many of you as we mark 75 years of women in the United States military. Congratulations and it's great to be here. It's important to recognize how far we've come and how far we still need to go. Uh, when all of our panelists served up, uh, signed up to serve their country, there were barriers in their way. Certain aircrafts they couldn't fly, certain ships that they couldn't be on, certain jobs that they were not allowed to have. That has changed, but there are still obstacles facing women in the military, obstacles that I know everyone wants to work together to try and eliminate. So the theme of today is beyond firsts. I've been thinking a lot about what that means. It means that it's no longer a novelty when a woman breaks a glass ceiling. But I must say, I think it's kind of awesome to be with these women who have done it. <laughs> I know they don't, they don't want to continue to be the first, but it's great to be able to. This is history. You all are here. This is history, really, to be able to hear from all of them. So without further ado, Let's, let's hear from them. And also, I want to remind you, too, you will have an opportunity to ask uh, them questions. So be thinking about what you would like to um, ask each of our distinguished guests here. So first, um, the Coast Guard Commandant, Admiral Linda Fagan. Okay. Thank you. So, thank you, Nora, and for everyone that's helped uh, put this event together. I can't think of a better location to be as we kick off Women's History Month, and I'm really uh, excited to be here. I, I'm about to do one of the things that I like least, which is talk a little bit about myself. This is generally is probably a trait uh, we all uh, we all share. I, but I just you know I want to reflect a little bit on uh, one how historic this is. Right? It uh, it has truly been a journey. It's been a journey for the nation a journey for each of our services, and a journey for each of us uh, individually. I reflected uh, at my change of command uh, this past June that had the then Commandant Owen Seiler not taken the decision to, to bring women into the service academy, into the Coast Guard Academy, and so that first class graduates in 1980. I arrived as a young 18-year-old in the summer of 1981. I would not be here today had that decision not been made at that, uh, that point in time. So it truly has been a journey. I also saw, 
I'm a proud mom up here right now. My favorite lieutenant, <laughs> Lieutenant Fagan. Is in, so she's here today, but one of the things that I reflect, she joined a Coast Guard that could not have been more different than the Coast Guard that I joined. And this just speaks to the, to the journey and to so many people that have made uh, the opportunity uh, for us here, here today. Uh, one of my primary focus areas as Commandant is around talent management and workforce management, making it easier for not just women, but all who want to serve in the Coast Guard, in the military, to find their way into the service, and then to stay and be able to take advantage of all of the opportunity uh, that is afforded. And many, we have many veterans in the audience and many people still in uniform. It's an incredibly exciting time to serve the nation and wear uh, the cloth of our uh, country. And so uh, I just consider myself uh, very fortunate to have been able uh, to take advantage of the law changes and things, uh, doors that were opened at sort of the right uh, point in time for me. And now uh, I consider it a privilege, really, it's what excites me every day, is to create that opportunity uh, for those that are coming up, uh, coming up behind me. But so thank you. Thanks, Norm. Thank you, Admiral Fagan. And I did go up to, to Cape May recently and, and yeah. visit the facility there, and they're doing incredible work, all the enlisted members there, of course, training hard. Training very yes. hard. <laughs> Next, please welcome the commander of the U.S. Transportation Command, Air Force General Jacqueline Van Ovost. So I want to say thanks to you, Nora, and thanks to Phyllis. What a tremendous opportunity it is uh, to share the stage with these incredible leaders um, who represent the past, present, and future uh, of our services. And again, right here in this amazing memorial. In the 75 years since so we've had the opportunity to serve, we certainly have come a long way. Our progress has been accelerating. But we, we have a ways to go still. And we're working on that. You know, only 30 years ago, uh, women were allowed to fly fighter aircraft, combat uh, aircraft. And only 10 years ago uh, were the restrictions on ground combat taken uh, off of uh, women. And now, we serve in a military where if you are talented and qualified, you can go do that job. Uh, and that's amazing. It uh, Joe opens up real, real doors. So all of us here, you know, and you in the audience have inherited this legacy, this expanding legacy of those tenacious people who have turned back the tide of cultural lethargy and decided to serve their nation in many different ways. As Admiral Fagan said, you know, those before us really uh, a tremendous oppor uh, influence on the opportunities that we have. And I think about, you know, beside us here on stage, we all had great supporters, men and women, who provided opportunities for us and supported and encouraged us along the way. And now those behind us, you, your daughters, your mentors, right? When I think about um, the opportunities that you have, it's awesome to see everyone here, it reinvigorates our commitment to continue to get after uh, any remaining vestiges of, of concerns and barriers that there might be out there to someone fulfilling uh, their purpose in life uh, here, here in our service. And that's what really motivates us every day. Because let me be clear, all of these efforts to ensure true inclusion uh, in the military is first and foremost about building a lethal, agile, and ready joint force. That is the first and foremost thing on our mind every day as we get to work, is are we ready? Are we ready today, and are we ready tomorrow? So historically, militaries reflected the societies that supported them. And we are at the 50th year of our all-volunteer force, and our force should continue to evolve to incorporate all of the talents and demographics of America, right? And this is especially true as we enter this area of global strategic competition. We need diversity of thought, diversity of experience, and capabilities all pulled together because we're getting after some really wicked hard problems in strategic competition. We need everyone at the table supporting us. And we are examples. Um, leadership matters. Inclusion matters. And you see us now all uh, generating results at the strategic, operational, and tactical level. So that's why we have to continue to recruit and retain talented women and men in our service, capable of thinking creatively, 
differently, innovating with the technology that we have so that we can create new concepts and capabilities so that we can remain, first and foremost, the most lethal fighting force in the world. For this reason, I encourage you to interact with folks here. These are decades of firsts sitting right here in this audience. Network here, those online, uh, and learn from each other. What a tremendous opportunity it is for us to learn from each other. Together, we're going to continue to push societal boundaries towards an area where beyond first, there are no, be no more firsts or only, just professional military ready to get after the needs of the nation with highly talented, diverse, and capable people before us, beside us, and behind us. So I'm pretty excited to be here. Thank you so much. And we want to welcome everyone that's joining us um, online as well, watching, and you too can submit questions. Now please welcome the commander of the United States Southern Command, Army General Laura Richardson. So thank you so much, Nora. Thank you for the time that you've invested today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you, Jan. Uh, Jan was a, a two-star general uh, when I was a lieutenant colonel right out of battalion command and had my first assignment to the Pentagon on the Army staff. And I watched a great role model uh, in all the meetings uh, and uh, just really tremendous. I want to thank you for your service. Phyllis, thank you as well, leading the charge here. Uh, it's an honor to be here. And um, certainly, as uh, my colleagues have talked about and uh, being on the stage here with all of them, it's about opportunities, right? And so now uh, all of these laws and policies have been changed to allow everybody the opportunity. And we shouldn't be surprised what happens when the opportunities uh, are there. Uh, this is what happens. And uh, there's no surprise. And so uh, just the uh, opportunities in the military, the mention of the uh, 50 years of the all-volunteer force, that's very important to us this year. Uh, and we have a, a little bit of ways to go to uh, connect with our population, our younger population, because our military is so very important. Um, a very well-known fact in terms of the incorporation of, uh, of women into military and security forces that make our security forces and our security stronger. Uh, and so I would say that uh, it's all about the opportunities. There are tons of opportunities, 178 different skill sets, 178 different jobs you can do in the military. Where else can you be a helicopter pilot, work at the White House, work at the United States Capitol, work at the Pentagon, lead America's sons and daughters in combat, all, do all of those things. I could have never imagined that I would be able to do that in the military. And talk about a challenge. Um, you are impacting national security and global security every single day in the military. You wake up and you impact it just like that. You want to have meaning to what you're doing in the military? This group does. Everybody here, and we got to get out and, and talk about our United States military, the strongest fighting force in the world. But we got to keep it that way. We got to keep it that way. Everything is open now, all the opportunities are there. We, again, we see what that does and what that affords everybody. And so, just very honored to be here, and I look forward to everybody's questions. Thank you. And please welcome the Vice Chief of Naval Operations, Navy Admiral Lisa Franchetti. Thank you very much, Nora, again, for spending so much time with us. Phyllis, thank you, and Jan, for organizing the event today. It's really wonderful to be here sitting up with these very inspiring leaders that I've had an opportunity to work with or watch from below for uh, many years. You know, sitting here in the Women's Memorial, this is a pretty good reminder of why I look forward to March every year to celebrate Women's History Month. It's really a time to pause and reflect on those pioneers and leaders that went before us who were able to work hard, break down barriers, and put in place the changes in law, in policy, and culture, really, that enabled all of us to be here today. 
I think it's a, the honor of a lifetime to be a witness to this history. And I think all of us have been part of the history and had an opportunity to pay it forward a little bit. I know when I came in the Navy in, in 1985, uh, a lot of the doors for women were closed. Um, I could not even have imagined being the commanding officer of a warship, a carrier strike group, a fleet, or the vice chief of naval operations. But pretty soon after I got in the Navy, it started to change. We had the opportunity in 1993, when the combat exclusion law was repealed, for women to serve on combatants at sea or fly combatant aircraft. And so I knew that the doors were starting to open. And once that happened, all of the firsts, they started to fall. We had our first woman CO of a combatant ship, our first woman CO of a fighter squadron, and then it went on and on and on. We have Admiral retired Deb Lower here today, who was our first warfare qualified female flag officer. Big shout out to one of my lifetime mentors. <laughs> and then we had... Uh, and then we had Rear Admiral Nora Tyson, then that became Vice Admiral Tyson, who was our first carrier strike group commander and numbered fleet commander. And then Admiral Michelle Howard, who was our first female four star. She was also our first vice chief and our first Naval Forces Europe and Africa, really leading the way. And now 10 years after the repeal of all combat exclusions, I can see that the doors are not just open, but they're completely gone. And I think the question for women today is no longer what can I do, it's what do I want to do? Because you can do anything in today's military. So when you think about the theme of today, which is beyond firsts, I am really happy to see us nearing an end of all the firsts. In, most recently in my service, we have our first woman executive officer and a chief of the boat of a submarine, our first woman aircraft carrier CO, our first woman uh, special warfare combatant crewman, and soon, uh, right now, this season, our first woman, Blue Angel. So very excited oh, yeah. to see her out there this year. And again, thanks to the example of these pioneers that we're seeing today, and Nora, Deb, and Michelle before them, all 83,000 female sailors can make a difference every day in every single one of our communities. I think that they are our shipmates, they are our, their daughters, their spouses, their sisters, they bring from across America all the critical thinking skills that we need to be able to be the world's most formidable fighting force, ready to deter, fight, and win whenever the nation needs us to do so. So again, I know there's a lot of folks in the audience that's on, online today. I would just like to offer one simple message, which is if you can see it, you can be it, and you can see it right here. So in today's military, I think it's a little bit of a choose your own adventure. You can be your best, you can do your best, you can be part of an amazing team and make a difference every day. So I'm really excited to be up here and uh, hear your questions today. Thank you. So. Well, thank you. In America's rich history, there have been hundreds of four stars and admirals, but there have only been 10 women. Today, there are four. This is the first time they have ever been together in a public setting, to he and you are here with them. This incredible moment. So thanks to all of you, just underscoring really how incredible this is, and thank you for, for gathering us. Let me start with you, General Van Ovost. What does it mean to be amongst so many of these incredible leaders? I know for the first time you guys had got together over dinner last night and then speaking in an interview with me that'll air on the CBS Evening News and part of a longer format that we have on CBS called Person to Person. What have you learned from them too, even after your incredible leadership on your own? Uh, this is so amazing. Um, the opportunities now abound. It's, you know, you think about when we first came in 35 years ago to now, you know, Emil Fagan said it, this is, not, this is not the Coast Guard I entered, this is not the Air Force, this is not the service that we entered. Uh, we helped create a service that's more inviting uh, and to, to ensure that we are more ready and more capable. And so to hear their stories and, you know, it's, it's not all that different. We were talking about how we sort of had the same challenges early on and it got better and the door, more doors open. We just blew open the doors, I like that. Uh, and we just blew, blew them open uh, so that folks uh, come, come in behind us. So, but today is really not about us. It's really about just thinking about all the challenges that our predecessors had 
uh, and how they you know, paved that path, made it smoother, made it wider, provided us more options. And then, and then just kind of collecting and thinking about all the options that you can, all of the career fields, everything is open to you. And the fact that we have improved the quality of life and quality of service that is going to inspire for generations to come. And so it's just been very exciting to be part of it all. Thank you. Uh, General Richardson and I were talking about this earlier. For each of these women to reach this point, they have all been serving more than, of course, three decades. Maintaining and keeping the best and the brightest in our military is incredibly important. So General Richardson, what would you say to a young woman looking at the US Army or thinking about maybe has been in the US Army and maybe like, well, I might want to leave. What would you say? Well, I would just say uh, uh, back to what I said earlier in terms of the impact that you get to have on national security uh, to our United States, but then also globally. All the positions that are available and open, the things that you get to do. I had no idea that I would get to do all those things that I've been able to do. And, uh, and so certainly the, uh, everything is there just for you to choose. I mean, you have a choice now uh, of what you want to do. And so I think it's just um, a matter of being able to connect the dots for our younger generation. It's coaches, teachers, parents, everybody in the community helping to connect these big ideas and these dreams for our young people to the military. And folks that are in the military, we've got to talk to them, right? Open communication. We can't do it on, on, uh, on social media and things like that. We have got to do this investment of time with our younger generation to uh, educate them on the opportunities that are there. Help them decide, okay, if you don't want to do, or you don't like what you're doing, what do you want to do? You know, here's some options. And then uh, connect those options if they're already in the service to those. But quite honestly, I mean, when I was a kid coming up in high school, uh, okay, I want to be a pilot, I want to be a doctor, but how do I get there? Uh, it costs a lot of money to get there, uh, both those routes. So how do I do that? Army ROTC and any one of our ROTCs open that, opens that door. Oh my gosh, it's just amazing. If you're in college, you're not really sure about the military, whether it's an appointment to an academy, it's ROTC or enlistment. There are options, and there are plenty of options. Uh, so we've got to connect with our younger generation. We've got to tell them about the military, because they don't know. 72% of our young generation does not know what resides in the military today. Those are the statistics, and those are daunting, and that's not good. Now, once they get in, our retention rate is over 100%. Once they get in, they're like, wow, look at all this. Right? We can retain. It's just like we've got to recruit, we've got to retain, we've got to train, and we've got to advance. So I think awesome. we have great opportunities. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. Admiral Fayen, as the nation's first female service chief, I know you faced many barriers in your career. What advice would you offer to those who may feel underrepresented, who are facing challenges? Yeah. So I, I shared uh, earlier, I was not welcomed on my first ship. I, uh, uh, they, so I was on the icebreaker Polar Star, which is on her way back from her 26 deep freeze. The ship has yep. not gotten younger. That's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> Neither have I, for that matter. <laughs> but I uh, reported, and the XO uh, calls me into a stateroom and um, said, hey, um, we weren't sure we were going to let your orders go through. We considered having your orders canceled. I was the only woman as part of the crew. In fact, for the two years that I was assigned, I was the only female on that ship. And at the time, I thought, oh, all right, well, good, good. They didn't do that. But then with, with more time and reflection, I'm like, well, why? Why did they think that that needed to be uh, necessary? And of course, fast forward to today, where that ship has got a fully integrated uh, crew, both officers and enlisted, and it just um, you know, creates uh, opportunity for, uh, for all. I, uh, when it was announced, it was just about last year at this time that I, it was announced that I was being nominated to be the commandant. In fact, it was at Sea Air Space, and uh, you know, the um, you know big announcement, and I'm leaving the venue, and this this woman chases me down, and she's like, "You have no idea who I am." I'm, you know, I'm like, "All right, I have no idea." We've all had this experience, like, "All right, <laughs> what's what's coming next?" And she she was uh, she works in the in the White House, budget uh, in the White House. And she says, my daughter is 10. And she can be anything 
because of you. And of course, my inside voice is like, your daughter can be anything, not just because of me, but because of all of the change uh, that we're talking about here and, uh, and all of the opportunity. And so what I would offer by way of advice, first, I never thought I would be a first. I don't particularly like talk about being a first. And you know this opportunity, and I see Vice Admiral Sally Bryce O'Hara here in the front row, a former uh, Vice Commandant, retired three star, right? Those are the trailblazers and the trendsetters that created uh, the opportunity that I've been able to uh, benefit from. But, but the advice that I would leave for I, any of us, and I was speaking with our young cadets uh, just a couple, a couple of days ago, and that is, you know, find your passion and then, you know, pursue it. And persistence matters. And it's not going to be easy work, but it is worth the endeavor and the commitment. And it takes time. You don't, I joke, like, I didn't wake up one morning last March and the secretary called, hey, I'm planning on sending your name over to the president. <laughs> right? There's a pro there was a 35 plus year process that got each of us here to this point. And, you know, there's, there's no shortcut in it. And so, and, you know, find your passion and then commit to the work, show up, uh, work at it, endeavor to make it better for those, you know, better for the people that you're leading and better for those that, that come behind you. And, and then all of a sudden, 35 years go by and here we are. So, <laughs> <laughs> so thanks. Um, well, Admiral Franchetti, we were talking about this. Legally, there are no barriers that should prevent women and others from pursuing what they want in, in the US military. But it is very different from when you joined, as well as those and many, many of the people here. Can you talk about some of the challenges that you experienced in the Navy? Well, as I said earlier, there was a lot of things I couldn't do when I came in the Navy. And that was very frustrating to me. I was an ROTC student. Uh, I felt like I should be able to do anything I wanted to do. And then it ran right into the barrier of not going able, being able to go to sea right away. So my first challenge was actually getting a billet, uh, one of the 17 a year that we had back then for women to go to sea. So when I finally got one of those, I got to my first ship. And my chief engineer, who was my boss at the time, uh, similar to Admiral Fagan, said, uh, I don't think women should be on ships. I don't think you should be here. And I think I'm going to make sure you fail. And for me, that was uh, pretty eye-opening that someone would say that to me. Um, but what I found through that adversity was that my team found out about it, my chief petty officers and all my colleagues in engineering. And they basically set out to make sure that that didn't happen and that he was wrong. So I think that I was able to just sort of let it roll like water off a duck's back and just get to work. I knew that if I did my best, I worked hard, I couldn't control what he was going to do or say, but I could make sure that we did our best. And so as a team, we rallied around uh, my division, my efforts, and we basically made it look like he was the failure for not wanting us to be there. So again, I'm really happy to say that that is the only time that I've run into that. That was back in 1987. So I'm pleased to say that I really haven't run into those challenges throughout the rest of my now 37 years uh, in the service. But that was a lesson right up front uh, that you need to be able to just put your head down, don't really worry about what other people think, and just do your best. And that will take you where you need to go. General Van Ovos, do you had a similar experience as an aviator? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so right after the, uh, the women were began to allow to fly fighters, I was, uh, I was in test pilot school and uh, flying the F-15. Uh, and uh, indeed, one of the senior instructors uh, pretty much said that you shouldn't be here. There's no reason for you to be here. Um, and, and, and so the, the thought was, hey, well, you, know, you could just you know, get out of the school. Uh, of course, that was not my plan, uh, and I, I was I was a little shocked. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, I was a little shocked uh, by the incident, uh, uh, and you know, it took me about a day. But I tell you what, I really leaned on my peers. You know, I was a captain, leaned on the other captains, the male, uh, my classmates, uh, and uh, and they just encouraged me and said, you know, you have every right to be here. Uh, you're a great pilot. You you can wax people. And we're going to help you, right? I didn't know basic fighter maneuvers because I'd flown a heavy airplane before I got there. Uh, and so I'm thrust into an airplane and, and all these maneuvers that everyone else already knew. 
So they worked with me on the side, and I studied hard, put my head down, went out, practice every time I can, so the next time I flew with or against this person, I was ready to wax them, right? <laughs> Just to be your best, right? But like, that's growth, that's change, you know, that's internalization, that's being persistent and determined, having a goal, uh, not being afraid to ask other people about, hey, how did you do this? You know, have a mentor, uh, because you know, people have been there. They may not have done exactly what you did, but there are people that understand and have walked that path before. Find those people and have them help you, and they absolutely will be excited to do so. General Richardson, as Southcom commander, I know that you have traveled extensively to the Caribbean, Latin America. How would you describe the extent to which countries in that region embrace the integration of women in their military ranks? I would say overall um, pretty good. Some are better than others, as you can imagine. Uh, and so the, um, uh, it's um, um, very, I, I could give great examples and then uh, some examples where they need to do more work. But uh, I will say that in this region, we've got uh, two women presidents. We have two women vice presidents. We have two women my, uh, ministers of defense. We've got the only woman chief of defense in the world right now from Jamaica. Uh, and we have a command sergeant major, female, in charge of the Colombian military, uh, only command sergeant major female in the world right now as well. So, I mean, we have some great shining examples. Um, like to say, I've got two U.S. ambassadors in the front row, um, Karen Williams and also Jean Maines. Uh, Jean is my deputy at Southcom. Uh, but in the region, we have a third of our U.S. ambassadors out of the 31 countries, a third of them are women. So we have great examples. Now the Southcom commander is a woman. Mm -hmm. There are all <laughs> kinds of examples. So it's a power of example. Uh, but, you know, quite honestly, when you go into a room and, uh, you, you know, you, um, you go talk to a leader, whether it's a head of state, a minister of defense, a foreign affairs minister, uh, the chief of defense, um, you know, they, I think that there's a general respect, but you have to also, it's, it, that's not enough. What are you there to talk to them about? And what are you there to do for them? How are you going to communicate with, uh, with them? How are you going to understand their challenges that they have? And uh, seeing things through their eyes, how they see their challenges? Because until you see it through their eyes, do you understand? I think we're able to, by the power of example, we always do women, peace, and security events in every country I go to. So I have my women, peace, and security lead, uh, Mary, uh, Major Aries Hoff. So stand up, Aries, real quick. Wave to everybody. <laughs> she, she does a great job. We will put conferences together, uh, regional, with several different countries. We will have, if we just do something within the country, we have their military and security forces that are represented there. And then we bring the chiefs of defense, the service chiefs there, and then they get to hear the barriers uh, that these women have. The nice thing is, is it's not just women at the table and their leaders, it's also men from their services too. And uh, it's quite honestly to see the younger generation empower women and want women to succeed is pretty incredible as well. Sometimes it's the older generation that you have to get through. Mm -hmm. so, so we'll just keep after it. I would say that it's a, a great example of, um, of integration of women into the military and security forces, but there's more work to be done. Mm -hmm. well, there's no doubt the leadership roles that you represent and certainly uh, many of the young women here today around the world, it's, it's once again a reminder to the rest of the world what makes this country the best country in the world. It really is. It's a reminder no matter where you go, wear that uniform so proudly because people would love to be able to have the opportunities that we have. General Ovos, I know you were just in the Middle East. Tell us what you're seeing there. Yeah, so the Middle East is a slightly, slightly different um, <laughs> uh, than, than South America. Uh, but uh, so th they're um, a few decades behind us, but uh, there is great hope. Uh, I was in Saudi Arabia, I was in Riyadh, and uh, the new Vision 2030 for that nation. Uh, there are women now driving, uh, there are women going to school, um, there are women entrepreneurs. Uh, they can decide to work without having their guardians sign them up uh, and, and get permission from your guardian. So they're, they're moving. And 
Uh, the shops are now open uh, all the time. It used to be it was closed for your times of prayer. Uh, and so all of a sudden, in fact, some of the older ladies would say, it's almost moving too fast for us. Now all of a sudden, women are driving and they're working. Uh, and you see them in the shops. And it's weird to see a woman alone in a shop working. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it goes back to what is the talent and, and how are they using those talents? And I think um, the leadership there is really recognizing that They've got to get beyond just oil. They've got to get to the digital economy and, and using all the women. I was in Kuwait doing a women's empowerment event. And I was told there by the, one of the, the lead ladies who put together these entrepreneurs that came and talked to us that 90% of the STEM graduates in Kuwait are women. So you can imagine if you're not using that 90%, right? And, so uh, from chemical engineers, digital, uh, so they're getting after it and, they're, and people are now seeking their advice and using them and leveraging them in ways that just, they just have not before. And so I have great hope, uh, not just about their economies, but about the decisions in their societies because uh, the women are, are now allowed to work and do those things. Mm -hmm. I think I've seen, doesn't the Emirates, the United Arab Emirates has, had, has some female pilots as well? They have, they have. Some have had their first fighter pilot as well, so it's, it's really very exciting. Uh, and, you know, uh, okay. going and seeing uh, the women in Qatar uh, that are pilots and, and loadmasters and uh, in the back of the airplane dropping things out and, uh, and seeing their capabilities, uh, they're excited and the men are excited as well. Admiral Franchetti, what has been the biggest influence in your career how have mentors helped you? Describe how that has worked and led you to the position you are today. Well, I would say that you know, my first mentor, of course, was my dad. Uh, he wasn't in the military, but he was a plant manager. And the one thing he taught me about was about people. And he was one of the original uh, management by wandering around type of leaders, <laughs> where he would go out and meet people. He knew all their stories. But he really could get a sense uh, of what was going on in the business and what he needed to do to and make sure that each one of those people could contribute their best. And I took that approach and that philosophy really with me uh, into the Navy. But I would say that uh, I have had and been a beneficiary of an incredible number of mentors. I always used to say that I was a big lump of Franchetti clay. <laughs> and they all came along and uh, did a little bit of molding on it to get me where I am today. But between Emma Lower, who's here, was really built a great network of the very first pioneering surface warfare women, to people like Admiral Tyson, our strike group commander, Admiral Howard, who I mentioned earlier, but also male mentors. John Peterson was a guy at my ROTC unit, who I still keep in touch with today, and he was always a great supporter, and another captain, Gary Bear, who was the one who helped me figure out a way to get to sea when there were only 17 opportunities back in 1985. So I feel like for everyone, there are those key mentors that will be the ones that tell you how to get there, what experiences you need to have, but also the ones that look at you and say, hey, you're not doing this well, and you need to improve in these a couple areas if you really want to move on. And so I've been the beneficiary of many great people like that, and I'm thankful for that. We're just about ready to take questions um, from the audience and from online, so um, be ready. I'm going to call on you um, shortly. General Richardson, I do want to ask you, um, as a soldier who has served in jobs previously unavailable to women, what lessons would you share for women who want to follow in your footsteps? I would say the, uh, just the availability of being able to do that. Um, I've always put my head down and just worked really hard at, uh, at what I've done. Um, I've never been handed anything. I've never been lucky. It's just a matter of putting your head down, working as hard as you can, and consistent performance. Uh, and that is, um, that is what has enabled me. I, I've tried not to, what's next? The only reason I look at what's next is because uh, I was in a dual military family and we got in, had to make sure we had childcare for uh, our daughter, Lauren. And uh, that's what, what next was about. It wasn't like, how am I gonna get promoted and what's gonna get me there? It was a matter of keeping me and my husband together everywhere we went. He was a couple years ahead of me. And where's the, where's the best child care that fits in with our family and our values and everything? And it was great because the, the Army offered that, the family caught child care services. Otherwise, I wouldn't be in the Army uh, today, um, quite honestly. And it's because of those programs that existed when I was back as a lieutenant 
um, that have existed throughout. You can be a dual military family. You can uh, have kids. You can both be successful. Uh, it just takes a little bit of planning and, and figuring out what's next and going places where you both can go. Um, but the opportunities are there. So um, lessons learned would be, you know, just, um, just uh, look for, uh, you can make it happen, I guess, is really what it is. Uh, you can do it. It and helps I, now to have technology because then you can share with your spouse where you're going to be and they can just share back with you so you can get right. your calendar set. <laughs> 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 well, wait a minute, better. I have this at that this time, one. right. <laughs> um, all right, last question, I do want to ask Admiral Fagan this. How do you, sometimes as the only woman in the room, use your voice to bring up a difficult subject without offending people or getting you in a position where maybe you think people won't like you, or whatever it may be? May be? I'm saying, how do you approach difficult subject matter, use your voice, but not maybe offend some of the people in the room? So uh, first, an observation, because this has happened not in the last 18 months, but in the last two years, in a room of very senior people, very senior, mostly white male senior people. And the, they're going around the table asking for perspective on a topic, and it'll come to me, and I will say something, and there's just sort of a nod, and they go around, and then two people later, same thing gets said, and they go, oh, that's a great idea. <laughs> and it's like, I, I just said that, right? So I share that only because that dynamic is still alive and well, even with all the the seniority. There were senior women in the Obama White House that said that that happened to them. So this is even in, you it's, know, yeah. Yeah. It's many societal. different settings. Yeah. So, for, so where I'm going to go with this is, right, particularly for the women in the room, you are at the table for a reason. Use your voice. Don't presume that the others sitting at the table have your perspective. And it may be an uncomfortable topic, but you need to use your voice. You're not there by accident. It's not random. It's not luck. You have earned your way into the room at the table and you know, know, your, know your subject matter, but use your voice. Uh, at this point, for me, now leading a service, it, it is interesting, too. All of a sudden, I've become very smart, very funny. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the people here in the room with me, right? It's like, wow, how, how did that happen? Because I'm still the same person that I was in some regards. But it, it, is, in, it is important to bring up the difficult topics. Uh, usually the approach that I take, and, and for us particularly as a service, we, uh, we don't do particularly well if the topic generates a lot of emotion. We, we start to lose kind of rational things. And so I'm, I'm the one that's constantly saying, lose the emotion. We need to be just, just matter of fact, raise the issue, and then with deliberation and intent. And yes, it may be an uncomfortable topic, but we have an obligation as senior leaders to make it better for those coming behind us. And if we don't have these difficult conversations, it won't be better in the future for the folks that are, uh, that are coming behind us. Thanks. Well said, yeah. <laughs> All right, do we have some questions from the audience? Oh, yeah. And we'll, we'll start in the, in the front here. Thank you. Wow, I'm a little starstruck. So, <laughs> ladies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, don't get too much directed to the Army Recruiting and I don't know how much. Task Force. This is nice. something that we talked about earlier. I'm, I'm looking at the bill. But my question, 35 plus years for, for any of you, was there a point in your career where you had decided it was time to hang up your boots and, and move on? And if so, why? And why just stay? Good question for a recruiter and retainer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I never got to the point where it was like time to go, because I would have gone. Right? I'm still here. <laughs> but I. <laughs> 
frequently would ask myself the question. I, I would run through the calculus, and usually it was around assignment time. And you know, so the question I always asked myself was, is, is what they're offering something that I can be excited about? Right? This is my life energy that I'm putting into it. Is it something that creates opportunity for growth, professional growth and opportunity? And then is it just, you know, again, something that I feel like I can add value to? And I've had the great fortune 35 plus years in, I've been able to answer yes to all three of those questions at every point where I pondered whether I should say or not. So I have recently been counseled that apparently I don't have any more upward mobility. <laughs> but it seems to have gone all right. So. <laughs> So I was definitely going to get out. I, had, I was a ROTC. I had a four-year uh, commitment. And um, you know, I had gone through this opportunity to go to a ship. Uh, I tried it out. I wanted to see if I really liked it, so I went to another ship. And uh, then I was on my shore duty. And I thought, eh, I'm not, I don't really like this. I was going to massage therapy school. I was living in southern Oregon. <laughs> I was definitely on my way uh, out of the Navy. And, um, you know, my dad said, hey, you might want to think about that a little bit more. So I got a What Color Is Your Parachute book, and I forced myself to sit down at lunch every day and do the workbook to figure out what did I really want to do. And in the end, what it came down to is the Navy had everything I wanted. I got to travel. I got a new job every two years. It's something I wanted. If you don't like your boss, they'll be gone or you'll be gone. Uh, <laughs> And, and I really liked our mission, right? <laughs> Support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I liked being able to be that beacon of democracy and hope and really bring our nation forward and defend far forward, but also to work with the most amazing people from across America and build great teams. So in the end, when you're looking for what keeps people in, you know, when they're 27, 28 years old, that's what kept me in, the mission. all that in spades, uh, and then it came time, and they wanted to, you know, send me to the Pentagon. And I thought, uh, yeah, at the time, I thought it was a death wish. I, I mean, I thought, oh, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Uh, and I, so I think I should get out. Uh, and my squadron commander and a couple other peers at Lehman said, you know, you know, what do you really want to do until I'm done? This is what I set my, my goals to do, and I'm done. Uh, and so now I can go be a test pilot for some company and just live out my life, you know, with my hair on fire. And uh, and they said, you know, you're they they started uh, ticking off the qualities they need in a leader. And they're like, you're really good at this, you're really good at that. And have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And and I hadn't really because I didn't see myself as a squadron commander. I didn't see myself as a wing commander because I had been so focused, you know, on engineering and uh, and and those goals. But they said, you know, you you really would do very well here. Uh, and so we, we recommend actually you come out of the test field and go into the leadership track back in operational. So I was one of those you know, weird unicorns that, dropped, that jumped out of that career field, took a chance, and went back to operations uh, and blossomed from there. And it was, it was because of the people. And yeah, it's a tactical skill, what you're doing in test pilot school, and, but it's the people that really mattered, uh, just like Lisa said. And, and I, as soon as I made that commitment, I'm like, I am all in, I'm doing this, of course, Ask my husband, the kids, hey, can, you know, are we, are we still good? We're, we're still good. Go. So, okay. It's such an important perspective. So I would say the, um, just uh, in terms of um, being able to keep our family together was important for me. And, um, and being able to, um, because I think the, the, the deal between my husband and I was if we couldn't find, you know, the right child care, if we couldn't make things work, uh, with all these different assignments every two to three years, then I would probably be the one to get out. So I was the one that was always looking for the, you know, the next place and calling around about six months out and trying to find the best locations, the best schools, the best, you know, all of this. What time do you open? What time do you close? You know, to make it work. You got to go to the field for a couple weeks, you know, what, is, what are your options then? That was what was first and foremost uh, in my mind. But I will tell you that the Army programs were all there. And all the way back to, I mean, I'm 36 years in the service now. My daughter is, uh, is 34. And so that's 
many years of trying to figure it out very early on, and we were able to do it. So, um, yeah, I guess it was with every different assignment that it came up for, you know, not because I wanted to get out, uh, but because, you know, it might not work for our family at that point, but it always did. And now the Army's expanding all of those things, child care centers and making yep. more and more. Um, I'm sure the other services are yep. uh, as well. Let's get some questions from the back, some of the young people that are here. I see so many, right? Stand up. Oh, yes, 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 ma'am. Good afternoon, ladies. <clears throat> Mass Arm Williams. Um, my question is, we're talking about, about Beyond First. We have those MOSs where in the Marine Corps, we haven't had a first yet. So with these Marines being 18, 19, 20 years old, and they pass these schools, the only thing that they're gonna be remembered by is what that first that they've done. Is that, do you think that first is a burden for them throughout their career because of what they had to go through and now that's all they're gonna be remembered by? And the second part of the question is, what advice would you give those young Marines? Even though we're different branches, but think of them as your soldiers, your airmen, your, that thing. I'd say the neat thing about the military is you write your own history, yeah. right? You have your own story to tell. So if you're going to be encumbered by that, then you'll be encumbered by that. The thing is, is I would say that uh, use that to your advantage and, um, and build your own history and your own story and tell your story and not be, um, not be encumbered by the fact that maybe you were a first. The good thing is, is that you won't be the last. Right. Mm. right. Yeah, being a first opens doors and gives you a platform to talk about all that's good in the service, in the organization. Like I say, I joke, right? I don't like talking about myself, but there were, there's definitely been uh, a tension that has come to being a first female service chief, and I very quickly pivot to, let me tell you about how great the Coast Guard is. Let me tell you about <laughs> what the opportunity is. Let me tell you about the workforce, what it means to uh, serve the nation, and then I can't wait to celebrate the next. Mm -hmm. Great question. Great question. And I love that. You write your own story and then yeah. tell your own story. Mm -hmm. It's a great message. Yes. Um, other questions? Future leaders. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I'm doing reverse discrimination. I'm yelling to young people to be yeah. first. <laughs> Good afternoon, Lieutenant Nikki Kirchner Hope, US Coast Guard. You each spoke a lot about um, some of the great things that you've all done. The Coast Guard, in particular, has recently, Admiral Yus excuse me, signed um, our harassing behavior instruction. Master Chief Webster is sitting in front of me as part of the anti-harassment program office. So there have been some great policy changes recently, um, but I'm not gonna, I'm not naive enough to say that making policy changes is easy, but in a lot of senses, it's easier than changing the culture. So can you speak please to how you would change the culture and how we as the culture keepers, the E6s, the lieutenants, um, can shift culture to be more inclusive? Yeah, so um, policy does matter, but it doesn't change culture. So when you look at all of the services have been on uh, a journey around sexual harassment, sexual assault, bullying, and I, I consider where we are today versus where we were you know, eight or 10 years ago in a much better position. So when somebody experiences harassment or bullying or assault, there is a strength of system in place that can be trusted and relied on. Uh, accusations are fully investigated. There's accountability where those, those um, uh, actions are, are substantiated. That wasn't always true. So that is positive uh, change. With regard to culture, right, and I love that you use the term culture keepers. I can talk about culture respect, uh, being valued, creating opportunity, a safe work environment where everybody is heard, valued, understood, where there's a sense of community and communi uh, community and family and belonging, right? That's what I want for our culture. But if the people on the mess deck after hours uh, have not internalized that, it doesn't matter how much I talk about it, right? Each of us needs to own it, and then when you see or hear someone do something inconsistent with that, 
You have to call them on it. You can't walk by it. And I, you know, speaking at the Cape May graduation just, uh, just about a, it was a week ago, and what I told the parents there is just this, this is the culture I want for the service is that it's, it's a safe environment where everyone is valued, heard, understood, and that we've got all of the right policies uh, in place, you know, should when you have an unfortunate incident that you can follow through. Because I told them, I said, what I want for your sons and daughters is what I want for my daughter. And it's no more complicated than that for me that, that I, you know, I, I would not have brought or encouraged my daughter to come in if I didn't believe that we can get this uh, done. But it is, I, I own it and from a describing what we're getting after, but you, and I see a lot of young Coast Guard folks back there, own the actual execution of it and carrying it forward day in, day out. Because it, it's insidious and it happens. There, most of the folks that are guilty of it are no better than to do or say those types of things than when I'm, when I'm around. I would just add as a reporter, abuse fosters in silence. Yeah. And sunlight yeah. is the best disinfectant. And I've spent the past six years reporting about sexual assault and harassment and domestic abuse in the military. And that attention has won numerous awards, an entire team that I've worked with at CBS News. And you know, just this past year, of course, the, the Secretary of Defense made uh, remarkable changes after sh a relatively short period of study for not only business but even in the military. They moved pretty quickly yeah. right. um, on that. So change is certainly afoot and yeah. Yeah. people's voice matters on that. But I'm a reporter too and it's something we've, we've, we've spent a lot of t attention on because in order for women to achieve leadership roles they have to feel like they're valued. Um, yes ma'am. So, uh, Good afternoon. My name is Denise Rucker Krepp, and I'm a former Coast Guard officer. But that's not the question I'm going to ask. It's more of my Army background slash Rucker. Um, about two years ago, Congress passed a law that says take all the Confederate names, including my family's name, off Army bases. So as a Rucker, I'm here to say thank you. But as a female officer, my question to all of you is, who are you going to put next? Because you're in a room full of women. <laughs> and you're taking family names down. Thank you. But who are the women you're going to name next? Because you're going to be naming ships. You're going to be naming roads. You're going to be naming facilities. And there are 100 plus years of, of uh, history of women. So my ask, again, as you take my family's name off, is put a woman's name on. And put more than one woman. Because let's be honest, there have been a lot of us that served. So thank you. Yeah, that's great. Okay, that's yeah. a good question. Yeah. That's strong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. I agree. Well, I agree. <laughs> well who, yeah. who decides the, what's, it's, that's a, each the of the secretaries. Yeah. yeah, the secretaries. The services each have a process for doing exactly that. So for example, you probably know in the Coast Guard, the fast response cutters, we're the only service that has a fleet of ships named after enlisted heroes. But this speaks to the let's not just fall into the traditional naming conventions and look for opportunity to honor service and progress of, you know, across the, the communities. Good afternoon, ladies. Captain Farmer, um, you mentioned the fight at the round table to make your voice heard, um, to not let uh, a male or another counterpart speak the same words that are coming out of your mouth and be recognized. Um, it seems like as you grow through the ranks, uh, seats at the table for women are smaller and smaller. You're seeing very few of us sitting there, um, especially with the population that's here. You would expect a lot more of us there. How are you fostering in your younger leaders um, to make it equal, to accept the opinions not only of another gender, um, of another background, of another culture, of another race, uh, just making that kind of distinguished ceiling of there's different people, but we're all one unit disappear? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll, I'll start with that one. I think all of us have been in positions where uh, we've not been heard, our voice hasn't been heard, even when we sat at the table. So, you know, 
besides uh, preparation for uh, being at the table, it's incumbent upon us as leaders uh, to develop uh, people uh, and to ensure that there are safe spaces that we can actually include and have discussions, right? Um, when I look around the table, I look for that diversity. Uh, and if I don't have the diversity, I mean, if you, everyone that walks and talks and looks like you and is an academy grad sitting at that table, you are not getting the best advice. So I'm not doing my organization good if I, if I don't have multiple uh, uh, folks with different experiences and different backgrounds. But it doesn't help if they don't speak at the table. So I go around, I want to make sure, one, that I have diversity uh, at the table, and two, if they're not speaking, I reach out to them, either publicly or privately. Say, hey, you know, what did you think about that issue? You didn't say anything, and I looked at you, and you didn't, you didn't respond. So you teach them that it is okay to talk there. Uh, and if someone is, you know, is in such a way that they're not ensuring that there are safe spaces to, to have that, or that you're not being included, that's a leadership issue. We just talked about that. That is a flat-out leadership issue, and we've got to get at that at every level, because we will not be able to give the best advice or make the best decisions without it. And I think that starts from, from the very beginning. When you create teams at basic training, all the way up to where you are now, to even, even at this level, my teams uh, have to have that diverse perspective. And they need to know, they need to count on me, that, that when they offer their advice, I have the courage to listen to it and to act accordingly. We have time for just one or two more quick questions. Um, yes, ma'am, you first, and then we'll go forward. Go ahead, ma'am. Yes, you. I'm coming. <laughs> no, you have to use it. Yeah, it's a video. <laughs> That's fine. I hope I'm not yelling. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, Staff Sergeant Duggins from uh, Joint Base Andrews. Hi, General Venovos. Nice to see you again. Um, so just a quick question for all of you. I know we're talking about a lot of first here, right? But I feel like we're, we're failing to mention some of the next, right? And so mm. I've only been in for five years. The Air Force that I walked into is a lot different than the Air Force everybody else has walked into. And still, some of the same challenges persist. Like, the biggest thing for me was when people were still shocked at like me being smart, right? Every, everywhere I've been, it's just like, oh, you're so smart. But it's also like, why is the assumption that I'm not? Like, I, I made it into this Air Force the same way everybody else made it into this Air Force. And I feel like we're not really talking about the, the stigmas that are still associated and a way forward to, because we have the people all the way at the top, all of you guys and all the leadership, really trying to enforce this change, and we have buy-in from the people all the way at the bottom, the brand new people that are just coming in. What are we to do about the people in the middle who really won't budge? <laughs> the frozen middle. The frozen middle. We call them the frozen middle. And they're a little insidious, because I look, it's fascinating, you know, so headquarters, sitting at the top of the organization, and I look down to the lieutenants, and you know, many sitting here, and to your point, right, eager for change, eager for the change that I'm talking about, generational change, transformational change. But what's insidious about it is I peer through the middle, and it's frozen solid, and it's clear. You don't even realize you've looked through it, right? And they're acting as an impediment to some of that change. I, so this is, there's, it is a little bit incumbent on all of us, but at a certain point, it's either, you know, you're, you're in the boat rowing in the direction we need to go for the, the, you know, good of the order for the organization, or you're not, and there's not always a seat on the bus for everybody. So at a certain point, like that, if, if that leadership becomes that much of an impediment, it needs to, it needs to move on. It's just not, not healthy uh, for, the, uh, for the organization. But it is, a, it's culture change is difficult. We are recruiting from, society, and so our workforces reflect societal norms, trends, good, bad, and otherwise. But it means every day, every person, you have to commit to the effort to build that inclusivity, the diversity, the opportunity uh, to be heard, to be valued, and not have somebody say, oh, you know, you're smart, right? Why, why wouldn't they presume that you've, you, again, you're in the room for a reason, you've got a voice, you've got to, uh, a lot of perspective to, uh, to add. 
One of the things that they talked about in a prior conversation that's going to air on our show, they talked about persistence and the importance of persistence. Forgive me, but I did read that one of your parents had some sign up in the house about winning and quitting. Remind me. <laughs> <laughs> Tell everybody here what it said. <laughs> You can soar with the eagles in the daytime, or you can hoot with the owls at night. <laughs> and there were a bunch of other sayings, too, but um, yeah, about winning and quitting and, um, and all of that. And so um, I, I do want to, if I could, Nora, go back to the, I, I, I don't think we could say the answer to the question any better than Linda did um, just now, but the, on the previous question in terms of your voice at the table, Sometimes, um, sometimes topics, um, I think that, uh, uh, and, and I would say my colleagues probably uh, agree with me, but there's some shaping of issues and topics and influencing that you have to do, that saying something out in a table or at a, at a forum might not be the right place to enter in that, um, that topic or that idea. There might be shaping that you need to do, that you want to do, so you have those alliances, so when you do bring it up, if that's how it's going to happen, that you do, you can count on those reinforcements that, say, that says, already have processed it and agreed with you that that was a good idea. Um, and it's better, I think, to do that on the front end. There will be times that you have to do that on the back end after, um, after a meeting or something like that. But, you know, I think that that's what's uh, good about us, is we know how to do that, shape that, influence, give ideas, you know, how to, how to convince people that, um, that, you know, this might be the best way to go. But sometimes how you deliver it or how you present it uh, matters just as much. So I would just offer that. So you're saying you usually find some allies before you go into the table to use your voice who already agree with you so that then they second you and third you right. when you present an right. idea. And that could be with anything, not just something in particular about gender or something like that. Mm -hmm. Right, that could be on anything. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think we've got one final question I see in the back. Good afternoon. Thank you uh, for your time. Sam Slani, United States Air Force. Since 1947, when the Women in Ar Integration and Armed Services Act was signed, how close do you truly think we are to full integration of women into the service versus accommodation, especially given the fact that we're still facing issues of child care, where predominantly we find that that falls on the woman, female spe access to female specialized health care, flying while pregnant, just obstacles as it relates to parenthood, and then even finding female specialized equipment so that we can do our jobs. Thank you. Yeah, so <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, this just goes back to you know women being accepted versus being included. Like if we were fully included, we would have the armor that is built for a woman's body based on how we carry the weight uh, uh, of the equipment we have to carry. We have flight suits that would fit us and, and uniforms that would fit us. Uh, so that we wouldn't have to be, you know, accommodating. And the good news is we're, we, we've identified those things. We've made changes. We, we've got the body armor. We have, you know, we, we can do pregnancy and flying now. You can, you know, some work we're doing in the missile fields. And, and so there's, there's been great progress. And what we need is everyone here. And so who's on the WIT, the Women's Initiative Team? We have a few here? Yeah, okay, all right, see. So, you know, we, with social media, it's been great because we've been able to crowdsource ideas uh, to, for continued change. What are the continued barriers? What's the friction points uh, that we still have that we can get after? We, there's been a big list. We've been going after it, not just in the Air Force, but in multiple services, but having the power of the Women's Initiative Team and the Bear Analysis Working Groups um, has been uh, phenomenal. So I want to thank all the leaders here that, are, that have been part of that. Uh, and we're just going to keep chipping away at it. But we need to bring And look, society is changing. Our needs are changing. We're, we're looking at the health care piece. Uh, and we, we have to be insistent upon it. We have to continue to show what does it mean from a readiness standpoint, all right? We're not ready because of this. And that's, that's how we rally cry. That's how we've been getting the data to say, look, we can be a more ready force if we did this. So that data-based um, assessments that are coming forward. So that's plus on the Air Force. I'll let the other services speak to some of the things that they've been doing. I just wanted to add that by the time you get to be us, it's pretty hard to see what it looks like from where you are. 
So the one thing I would ask is that as you're seeing these barriers or these challenges, we may not necessarily be as aware of them as you are. So again, to the point about using your voice, you really do want to make sure that ways we have these forums and you have opportunities, we have listening tours. You know, a lot of leaders are going around, out and about, gathering information on how we can make things better for all of our service members. You want to continue to, to bring them up because there is a big list, and I am happy to say that I think we are getting after them. It takes a little bit of time, um, but we have to be insistent on going after the challenges. So I really appreciate that, that now I see some of these challenges. I'm going to take that back and ask in my own service. We have a women's integration team as well, and, uh, and see what, is, what else is on the list that we can get after. I've allowed a lot, probably way too many questions, but they were all so good, so thank you. So I will now give an opportunity um, for each of you to make some closing remarks, and they certainly don't have to be long, you know. <laughs> um, thank you. Bye. <laughs> so, so, again. Nor Nora and, and you know you guys are the military. You're the ones that are on time. Very like, yeah. strong. <laughs> but I just want to thank everyone that helped uh, put the event together. Uh, it really is a, a privilege to be here with you, share a little bit of perspective. And I, you know, I say this to our Coast Guard men and women. Right, this is our service. It's our Coast Guard. This is our journey, and together we make it better. We have made a ton of progress since I walked into the Coast Guard Academy in 1981, but we're not where we need to be, and together we need to continue to, uh, to make it better. Thank you. Just, I'll just add my thanks, and uh, you know, we have come a long way, uh, but I tell you, there is great opportunity. You've heard it here. We have great training. Uh, and initiatives, you can now, the quality of life and quality of service has tremendously changed in the 35 years I've been in this service. It continues to change to meet our needs. We're the most lethal, agile, and ready force in the world, and because of you, we will continue to be, so thank you. It's my honor to be part of the greatest fighting force military in the world. And I want to thank all of you. Um, it's an honor to do this. Um, thank you to my colleagues sitting here. We have to make sure that there's a bench behind General Richardson, Admiral Franchetti, General Van Ovos, and Admiral Fagan. Right? Who's on the bench? Who's behind us? And who's in the pipeline? You can't take your eye off the ball, or we will lose a generation. That's how quickly it happens. So thank you for being here. Thank you for the support. And uh, Nora, again, thank you. Phyllis, Jan, thank you very much. Thank you. I likewise want to say thank you. And again, it's a really a privilege to be here with all the firsts because I've actually never been a first. I've been a second, third, a fourth, or we never, <laughs> not even stopped counting by the time I got here, which is a real sign, I think, of the progress that all of our services have made. Again, very proud to be part of the Navy and the Joint Force. I would say just one thing, uh, especially to our younger folks out there as you're plotting out your career, is I always adopted this philosophy of Admiral Chester Nimitz, who commanded our Navy in World War II in the Pacific. And I'll paraphrase it here. He said, learn all you can, do your best, and don't worry about the things you can't control. I think that's good to keep that always in the back of your mind. Set your sights on where you want to go, and just head in that direction, and you'll end up where you're supposed to be. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for participating in this incredibly historic event. Thank you. I've learned so much from sitting up here and listening to you. Um, to many of the women in the audience, I hope that at the 100th anniversary of women in the US military. I'll be interviewing you up here, or maybe some, one of my daughters will be interviewing you, so stay in the pipeline. Um, I, I recently heard someone say, I don't think the future is female, the present is female. So let's make that a reality. Thanks to the museum for having us all. Phyllis, thank you so much, and Jan, for your leadership, and thanks for being here. <laughs>